And in Numbers 11 and verse 12, we find Moses, during the time of judgment, when the fire of God was falling in judgment upon the people of God, it says then, the people cried out to Moses. And when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. That is Numbers 11 and verse 2. This is a persistent prayer that Moses had to pray to avert the fire of God's judgment. And again, in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 25 to 26, Moses says, Thus I prostrated myself before the Lord forty days and forty nights. I kept prostrating myself because the Lord had said he would destroy you. Therefore I prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your inheritance, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. So here we have persistent praying. Time and time again, we'll be called on by the Lord to be involved in persistent praying. And we read, and you can see all the examples that I give to you in the study guide, how people prayed throughout the whole of the Old Testament, persisting in prayer. Perhaps we should look at uh, 1 Kings 8, verses uh, 28 and onwards. It's Solomon's prayer, and you can look at that for yourself. 1 Kings 8, 28 to 54, praying uh, persistently because he knew that as the temple was dedicated, he needed God's blessing on that. And that's just like the dedication of your life and my life to God. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, and so we need to pray that the blessing of God would come upon us and that our lives would come under the uh, blessing of the Holy Spirit. And that will require continual, persistent prayer. Now in the New Testament again, we have the same stress that the Holy Spirit places on persistent praying. Jesus in Luke 18 verse 1 speaks a parable and he says in this parable the meaning of it was that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Here is a cry for persistent praying. And in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17, Paul says, pray without ceasing. So we see time and time again, God expects us to persist in prayer. Now the next Hebrew word is paga. It means to approach or to plead and it's the strongest form of Old Testament pleading. It's often translated intercede or entreat. It literally means to approach with violence. Now we're going to look at that in more detail and give a whole session to the ministry of intercession. But let's note right now in passing that intercession in the Old Testament was especially the role of the prophets because they were called with the necessary anointing to approach God's face. And when we come to look at that in detail, we'll see how significant it is. It's also the chief ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 and verse 12 speaks about the intercessory ministry of the suffering servant of the Lord. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. And because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is speaking about the ministry of Christ, the Messiah, God's suffering servant. And in New Testament passages, Hebrews 7, verse 25, Romans 8, verse 34, we find that the chief and principal work of Jesus Christ now, seated at the Father's right hand, is to ever live to make intercession for us. Now the fourth Hebrew word we're looking at is sha'al, which means to ask. And it's a word which the Old Testament uses to describe uh, when people pray for special needs, like when they need His grace or deliverance or some special need for information or guidance. And it was first used as, as a word for prayer in Joshua 1 and verse 1. It was uh, Judges 1 and verse 1. It was after the death of Joshua. And the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be the first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? They felt the need because... The great warrior and leader, Joshua, was gone. He was dead. 
Who now is going to lead the armies of Israel? Who now is going to be the one to deliver them against the enemy, deliver them from the enemy that come against them? And so they ask God. Now this reminds you that when you are in a situation where you have a need in your life, this should be your instinctive response, crying out to God, asking Him for His grace and for His mercy. Now we find throughout the whole Old Testament again that people are asking God for many situations and He puts that prayer request upon them. In 1 Kings 3 verse 5, Gibeon, at Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and God said, ask, what shall I give you? So God suggests to Solomon that he should ask. So God wants you to ask. He, he would just come to you and say, please ask me. I don't know if you recall Psalm 2 and verse 8. Let me quote it for you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. Now when God wants you to ask, he wants you to ask big requests. This actually are the words that God the Father put on the lips of God the Son so that Jesus Christ would intercede for the nations of the world. And when we line up with the intercessory will of Jesus, you will find that we will be praying exactly the same things. So that we will be praying what Jesus is praying for the nations of the earth. And God says, ask me and I will give it to you. So when God calls us to ask, he calls us to ask for big things, as well as the small things. In fact, there is nothing too big that is beyond God's ability to deal with, and there is nothing too small that God is so big that he will not be concerned about, not at all. Now this type of praying continues in the New Testament. Jesus says in Luke 11 and verse 9, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And again in John 14 verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And so we see God is serious about this. He wants us to learn to ask. Now the next word we're looking at is shalah. Shalah, which means to beseech. And it's an unusual phrase in the Hebrew, which means literally to smooth God's face or to make God's face pleasant or sweet. It's usually translated beseech. But shalah suggests talking sweetly and quietly to God, gently reasoning with him, as opposed to the noise or, or the violence that is uh, implied in the, the use of the word paga, for example. Uh, in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 12, it says of Moses that he pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Now, can you, can you pick up the sweetness that's behind that praying? Lord, why does your wrath burn against us like this? It seemed that God was about to consume the people of God. And Moses intervened, and that sweet expression and persuasion and beseeching turned away God's anger. It's wonderful to be able to come to a God like that who will listen to us in times of crisis or difficulty or at times perhaps when there is a, a, his judgment is upon us or there are some very serious issues that need resolving and we know God's anger is kindled against us. We can come to him, speak to him. He invites us to beseech him, to smooth his face. Now, many, many times in the scriptures this kind of praying is found. In Malachi 1 and verse 9, it says, But now entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts. So God is confronting the people of Malachi's day with the sin in the nation, with the sin in the, in the hearts of the people of God. And he says, okay, deal with that sin. 
put that sin away and begin to entreat the Lord, speak to him tenderly, speak to him and persuade him, be sweet in your praying and you will be able to turn away his wrath and his anger through your repentance and through your humble praying. Now, this kind of association between prayer and, and uh, entreating developed throughout the Bible and this is how and why we read at times that prayer is like incense. It's that sweet smelling fragrance that comes to God. For example, in Psalm 141 and verse 2, it says, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And we know, and you will see from the verses in your study guide, that this is developed throughout the Bible until it comes to the book of Revelation, where we find that the prayers of the saints are considered as incense before the throne of the Father. Now we come to another word, zak, which means to cry out. The Old Testament uses this phrase to describe prayer when God asks us to correct, or when we want to ask God to correct something which is, which is going wrong in our lives, where there's a crisis and we need to be set free from some trouble or other. We cry out to God. Time and time again we read in the Bible how the, the children of Israel cried out and in Exodus 2.23 it says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. It doesn't say that they actually cried out to the Lord in this verse. Maybe they did. But more than that, they were crying out because of the burden that was upon them, the bondage that they were facing. And God heard that cry. Isn't it wonderful to know that even when we cry out in our heart, not necessarily conscious that we're crying out to God, but God hears the cry of the heart. In fact, characteristically, God hears the cry of the heart. And all other forms of praying, if they're intellectual praying, is not going to be heard by God. It's when you cry from your heart concerning the need, that's when God hears you. And more explicitly, in Exodus 14, verse 10, the people of God cry out to him. You remember, they've escaped from Egypt, and yet Pharaoh and the army is behind them. The Red Sea is before him. There is no before them. There is no escape. Exodus 14, verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So during this time of great need, we cry out to God and ask him to help us and bless us and strengthen us and rescue us. And the New Testament shows us that this kind of praying is taken up by the Holy Spirit who teaches us how to cry out to the Lord. In Romans 8 and verse 15, it says, If you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Yes, the Holy Spirit helps us to cry out to the Father. That concludes today's teaching on effective prayer. And I pray that you have been blessed by the teaching from the Word of God on this most vital subject and that God has been developing your prayer life. Next time, we're going to go deeper into the subject Goodbye. God bless you.